Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. Ain't gonna hurt. Is my boomstick. Game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Bargain Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandro Luketic. And today we're talking 2018's Upgrade. We assume if you're listening to the episode, you have already seen the movie. And I have seen this movie a few times now. Um, and I honestly believe like everything I ever recommend to you to watch. This is the first time you've seen it. Yes. <laughs> I'm maybe there was a time I watched something before. That <laughs> All right. So I am right. Okay, cool. Yeah, Maybe I don't have the episode list in front of me, but I'm sure there's one. Had you ever, uh, <laughs> had you ever heard of this before? Yeah, you were talking about it some time ago. Okay, so just me. Yeah, that... like, and and we didn't even really have an in-depth conversation about it. You were just saying, yeah, I saw this movie. I remember the name when you told me. Yeah. I don't remember anything else about you telling me. And, and that's a huge problem. And I think that's a very common one because love it or hate it. I think this is a movie that people should really see. I mean, it's well, only see how that's four years problem. old. Problem just means that you need to talk about it more. And that's that's why I, I brought it up, man. Uh, that's why we're here because this is an interesting film that just kind of came out of nowhere, and no one's talking about it. Was this even released in theaters, or did this go to like a straight to streaming service? Uh, I believe it had a theatrical release. Uh, it definitely did the uh, the film circuit real well. Makes um, me wonder what's going to happen when you talk about the box office. <laughs> <laughs> it should be a giveaway if there was a theatrical release, right? Uh, yes and no. There's a difference between release and wide release, right? <sighs> I don't care. Was it in <laughs> theaters for people to watch? I don't care if it was wide or not. Just Yes, it did make it to theaters. All right, you jerk. <laughs> Why am I a jerk? Yeah, give me a hard time on semantics. Fine. They're too you, kn you knew what I meant. You're different. Okay, it, uh, here. Opening weekend, it was in 1,457 theaters. Is that a lot? No. Not, not really. Know. Not if that's worldwide, no. <laughs> 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 You're laughing now, but just wait. I have yet to even watch the movie. This episode's going to be all of you. Oh, great. Going in blind. <laughs> Activate STEM. <laughs> all right. Let's do, let's do this. Let's talk about this movie. All right. That I did watch. This, I, I, I'm, I'm glad. I shouldn't have to clarify that, but I did watch it. Well done. You, you've done your homework. I'm proud of you. Um, interesting opening to the film, like the uh, the sound wave opening reading, like the production company credits, which I haven't seen before. And it really does set the tone for the movie. Because this is kind of like, would you even consider it to be cyberpunk-ish? No. Jason, I find this to be like one of the most off-putting parts of the movie. And I say off-putting, but I don't mean it with the same negative connotation as it normally is. You see that it's a very technologically evolved world, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have the same uh, like feel where in a cyberpunk movie, the actual world has evolved technologically. Yeah. It's more just certain facets of the world. So vehicles, upgrades to human bodies, things within the house like, you know, interactive screens on the table, but not the house itself. Yeah. And it also does not carry any semblance. Uh, I mean, there's a run downtown. We'll get to that. Yeah. But, like, it doesn't have, like, a dystopian feel towards the entire, like, universe. Exactly. And it's, it's so unfamiliar to me because normally when I expect one of these futuristic movies, I expect, like, everything to be futuristic and everything to be dystopian, not just select portions of technology that humans would have selectively chosen to upgrade technology wise. And then it's like, well, why change a building if it's fine? Right? Well, I, th I think this is, this is a world that's on its way to what we expect with cyberpunk. Like this is a world on its way to Blade Runner. It's kind of like um, the first Mad Max film is not post-apocalyptic. It happens as the world is starting to crumble in certain areas. So like you can tell, there's change happening and you can see it, but they haven't gotten to their, like the final point. Yeah. Um, and if that's the case here, this is even earlier. Oh yeah. Um, 
I actually know when the movie is set. They don't outright say it. Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. But to have a world that's changing what looks to be relatively quickly uh, compared to what we have today, wh- who better to have as the star of the film, like the main character, uh, than a technophobe? I thought that was a brilliant choice. Somebody who just rejects all of the technological advancements. And I'm talking about Gray Trace. Uh, played by Logan Marshall Green. Um, He's in his garage building a wicked car, a classic Firebird. Um, Asha Trace, his wife, played by Melanie Vallejo, uh, arrives at home in her smart car after a long day of work. And this smart car is... I don't even know about the design. Do you think that's something we're going to eventually arrive at? Um, I I feel like if we had cars that were this futuristic they wouldn't be made to look like tanks it it does look like something batman would drive although at the same time if i'm trying to put myself in the mentality of it if i'm gonna have like a really smart car i would want something that like if it rolled for example Mm -hmm. it has a design where it could recover from that right there's a reason why suvs are the highest for tipping it's because the more rectangular shape and the higher build so Maybe it makes more sense, but since that's not necessarily going to be a factor in the movie, I don't know why they went with this. Maybe that's maybe it that's is, what they. It, it is a factor in the movie. Well, okay, but that, in the that movie, car turtles hard. Yes, but in the movie, that was going to happen regardless of the type of vehicle. Good that point. could have been if they were driving his, like not it taking over, but them having a car accident could have taken place in one of his retro cars, right? Yeah. But I do agree, having a character that is completely against technology does make sense. And this is where the timeline also fits in, because when you're in that transition, you're more likely to have people that are still stuck in the old ways. Whereas if this was 50 years in, then this character would have grown up with it, as opposed to it being introduced in their life and maybe are not as against it. So absolutely, fantastically, like just you know, wrapped it up in a pretty bow. Like they, they nailed this idea that they were going for. And and not only that, I agree with exactly what you're saying, but it immediately allows us to attach ourselves and familiarize ourselves with gray because he is like us. He is handsome. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, at least for me, that's, I was like, yeah, this, I can get, I can relate to this guy. He's a handsome dude. I know what that's like. The toils and troubles of the daily life of a handsome dude. Yeah. Stay in your lane there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the, the two end up having like you know your stereotypical loving couples banter and gray convinces uh asha to join him at dropping off the firebird to the client who paid him to build it um i do have to say going back to what we were just talking about the color of this movie is amazing um natural light filmed beautifully then you get neon accents here and there it just it's a very sharp looking movie um and speaking of sharp you want to talk about a good looking man logan marshall green i think we can agree is the american tom hardy uh yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i i have here what year is it near future question mark and we mentioned time i actually went into trivia a little bit and I'm just going to say right now that there is a character death and when that person dies, they were 38 years old and you can see on the record that they were born in 2008. So the year is 2046. And I think that's that's, a lot more. I think that's realistic than I did. Oh yeah. I'm stunned. Normally you, uh, you school me with this trivia. Uh, and be honest with you, I only watched the movie once, and it was right before I got what might have been COVID. So, yeah. <laughs> that, that's put, a great excuse. I love I'd it. Put, I'd put that, like, my viewing time on this movie is not my usual two viewings. It was maybe 0.9, because I think when I got COVID, potentially, I lost some of my memories. <laughs> I'm sure they weren't good anyway. You're just making room for new ones. Don't worry about it. I meant of the movie. <laughs> oh, that's why I'm here, man. I'll, I'm the one with the notes. I'll keep you on track. I'll Listen, remind you of stuff. My memory is fine. Now, can we move on, Brad? You got it, sir. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, you mentioned the smart house with a tablet countertop, which I thought was kind of cool. But I, what I really enjoyed was the wicked shot of the futuristic city. Like, it's only slightly more advanced than what we have now, but almost the... Have you ever heard of the urban forest um, no. architecture? You know, those are like uh, giant apartment buildings or condo buildings that have um, trees and vegetation growing around the exterior all the way up. It's almost no. like yeah, keeping the city green, oxygen friendly, and whatnot. That's exactly what this is, and I I love that style of architecture. So I was really stoked about that. The the film immediately builds a world in a few minutes. Is essentially what I'm saying. Hmm. You could have just said that. Shut up. <laughs> uh, they arrive at the client's house, uh, and this client being multi millionaire tech developer Aaron Keen. Um, they arrive at his two pillars, signifying a door. <laughs> it's so stupid. Because, so like, I guess they just have the staircase there and it takes them into this, like, subterranean mansion, which, I, honestly, I have to say is probably budgetary. So, I think that makes sense. It's a cool idea. It's just strange. The thing is, when we meet this character and you see how much of an introvert he is. Yeah. Like that, like, oh, I don't know what, what you would call it, like that eccentric genius. It made sense in my mind. I'm like, yeah. yeah, this person is trying to distance themselves from everything else as much as possible. That immediately made me wonder, like, why does he want an old muscle car? Yeah, it is weird, right? Dude um, lives underground and, I don't know, makes love to his computer. What does yeah. he want with this car? I don't know. I have it written down here that he is a super awkward, uninteresting, dumbed-down clone of Rami Malik. I think that's accurate. Ah, oh, Rami Malek would have been good for this role, too. It would have been perfect. Not not to say that um, um, Harrison Gilbertson, is it? Yeah. Uh, was bad by any means. No, no, no. He was great. It's just a weird character. And yeah. as the movie progresses, specifically towards the end, we understand why this character is in the movie and, like, why he seems so weak-willed, which I, I was very appreciative of upon a rewatch. Like, there's a lot you kind of pick up along the way in your first viewing that upon a second viewing it just cements it in places like this is all deliberate filmmaking it's great um but aaron shows uh uh gray and asha his newest accomplishment invention which is called stem and it's a a chip of sorts that he describes as a newer better brain sure it, it kind of drops off from that point so you're like obviously this is going to be a major uh, plot involvement at some point yeah, because a movie called upgrade i doubt it never <laughs> uh but it just kind of cuts from there on to um that night on the drive home uh ash's smart car ignores her directions and she and gray end up in a sketchy part of town that happens to be his old neighborhood which i found weird that they would reference that um it doesn't matter it doesn't matter. It never matter. matters that that's his old neighborhood. No. It's never comes up later that he has a familiarity with the layout of it or that he has a building that he knows that he can hide out in. It never comes up. No. And it by mentioning the fact that they're in his old neighborhood, you'd think it would calm him down a bit more. But it has no, no effect on either of them. It's like, oh, this is my old neighborhood. And they're still panicking because the car is not listening to them. Um. It ends up having multiple errors and crashes in front of a homeless camp. Uh, another car pulls up and a group of masked men, well, not all of them masked anyway, uh, pull out of, or get out of the pull them out of the car um, and shoot the couple all while a police drone captures this on film from a distance. Uh, Gray's, just, yeah, go ahead. Just watching. Just, yeah. Nobody responding. Just watching. No, and we have to assume that the police are either, either overworked or overly corrupt. Um, but yeah, Gray is paralyzed and watches Asha die after one of the men removes his wedding ring in what is an absolutely horrifying scene. Um, they humanize this character of Gray so well in this film. And they make him feel alienated before... We actually get the reason why he's alienated. So good job. Great camera work uh, doing like a vertical 360 swoop, which is I thought was kind of cool. Very disorienting, but kind of led to the scene or added to the scene. 
But then we cut to him on life support at the, in a hospital bed with the uh, three months later on the screen. As scraggly gray is in a wheelchair being shown how his house has been modified to help him in his new state. And it's so depressing. Like, uh, do you remember the scene where the house is making him his green protein shake? No. Okay. COVID brain. I got you. Don't worry. I, I remember a number of the scenes with the automated house. Yeah. Well, I, I just can't remember the protein shake one. Yeah, that that's the introduction to show how he can't do anything for himself. Uh, and, of course, he's hating everything because uh, his will to live is obviously gone. His wife is dead. He hates technology. And now he has to rely on it to stay alive. Yep. Like, everything he loved in the world is gone. And everything that he hates about the world is now keeping him alive. Um, Except for his mom. His mom. Which, I mean, like, his God bless that woman. Because... The scene where he's laying in bed and she has to give him a sponge bath. Do you remember that scene at least? The look I remember on, the SpongeBob, yep. Or, the SpongeBob. <laughs> you really are a father now. No, my daughter's not in the SpongeBob yet. Yeah. Let's keep it that way. Um, but the look on his face is just pure self loathing. And she like tries to lift him up to like get under his armpits and everything, and he just starts vomiting, and he's just he's breaking down. He breaks down crying when his mom is cutting his beard. Like this man has no will to live at all. Mm -hmm. And and this is a character that's it's already been driven into us that we love this guy. Like this this is us. We we know him. Then we're introduced to Detective Cortez, played by Betty Gabriel, who is phenomenal in everything that she has ever done um gray and his mother visit her to see how much progress the police have made on the case um and this is where like i said before this is how i found out what year it's set in because of the case file showing asha's age um and gray's furious over the lack of news because the police haven't done anything yeah it's like we came to get a progress report what's that no progress report None. awesome <laughs> And like, you had a police drone recording the thing. What progress did you make? None. Yeah. And that's just it. Like, <laughs> they basically give him all of the information they have. And they're like, here, you do it. Yeah. And right, obviously, like, this is after, you know, he's got to have his whole life controlled by technology now. And yet here's technology. And the one thing he wants it to do is help identify the assailants doing nothing for him. Nothing. Um, obviously, even more downtrodden, Gray returns home in his wheelchair and uh, he gets medication by automatic injection um, and he just tries to overdose. He keeps telling the, the computer that there was an error and the injection didn't work and he keeps getting shot after shot after shot in his hand, trying to kill himself until he starts foaming at the mouth and passes out and the house calls an ambulance for him. Well, the, the machine even tells him, like, any further doses would be fatal. Yeah. And, yeah, that's that's what he wants. All he wants now is to die. So, again, here we are. Let's recap. He requires technology to survive, but technology can't help him find the assailants and can't even help him kill himself. No. It is his enemy. Technology is his greatest enemy. Like, if you haven't set up a scenario to display that he is any more helpless and at like the mercy of technology. I don't know how you could have done it. No, it's, it's, this is probably the best. And I hate to dumb it down by saying this term, but fish out of water scenario, but that, that perfectly describes it. It's just so much more, but it's so much deeper than that. It's not even a fish though. He's a person. I, yeah. Right. Oh, I get it because yep. the movie has hooked you. Ah, oh, oh, okay. Well, I mean, we're only maybe twenty minutes in before the pun, so that's not so bad. It was pretty good too. <laughs> let's let's keep it at one. Um, at the hospital, Gray is visited by Aaron, who offers him the chance to reclaim his bodily function, uh, and that would be surgically implanting stem the chip we saw earlier, uh, where he was shot. Interesting proposition would you do that 
the stem. Yeah. Would you have that implant done with the hopes that you'd be able to use your body again like you used to? I mean, it is difficult to put yourself in the mentality of somebody whose brain has almost broken to the point that you're trying to kill yourself. I would argue that he is broken already. Maybe not completely, though. You're right. But, I mean, it definitely seems like I would. Because at this point, I'm just trying to put myself in the mentality of of this character. It's like, he has nothing else. And desperate times call for desperate measures. Your your response to that proposal, clearly going to be different in this scenario than any other. Yep. The one thing that I thought should have been mentioned in the film is Aaron being like, look, I saw your medical records. I know why you're here. If you agree to the surgery, you have to promise me to not die because <laughs> this is expensive. Very expensive. Very illegal. See, I don't think he needs to be alive is the thing that I'm having difficulty with. Who? Gray? Yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? Of course he does. If STEM can control limbs, why can't it control a heartbeat? Like, I feel like you could put it in a recently deceased person and it would no, work. It's, no, it's because, as we'll get to eventually here, it has to get a command from the brain to do the action. And if that command is like, take over vital functions, it can then do that, but it has to be instructed to do that. Mm. I feel like at the end of the movie, that's not the case, but okay. Well, yeah, and there's an explanation for that. Well, we'll get to it. You're the one jumping ahead, man. Hey, I question anyway, it in the flow of the conversation. The surgery is a success. Gray's brain gives STEM a command, and STEM makes it happen. The whole thing has to remain a secret, though, because it's highly illegal, as we had said. Um, some great acting by uh, Marshall Green here, though, when you see him, like, when he starts being able to move his hand again and then eventually stand up out of his chair, drop his crutches, the look on his face, like this guy's, this guy needs to be more well known. Like, yeah, I honestly going into this movie had no idea who this actor is. I saw him in one other movie, uh, the invitation, which was also really, really good. It really reminded me of, um, coherence, but less science fiction and more suspense thriller. Ah, coherence. That was a good one. Yeah, it was. Uh, Gray returns home. Uh, gets some awesome camera work here as he uh, uh, is walking up the stairs. Like he takes his wheelchair inside to remain, like you know, give off the appearance that he's still unable to move. But yes, as soon as the door is closed, to stay a secret, right? Exactly. Stands up, starts moving, but the camera keeps Gray's head at the center of the screen during every movement. Um, I know that when that happens in like music videos and film when the camera's looking at the person's face, they actually have a rig strapped to them. So the camera's focused immediately on their face. So when they move, the camera's always in focus and locked on them. Did you do any trivia search as to how they got this to work? No. Um, <laughs> they, they kept a, a phone on him and through Alexa, like synced up the um, gyroscope. So the camera is always fixed to the, where the phone was. So it was the exact same idea, but wireless, which I don't oh. think has been done before. Cool. Um, yeah, here I he goes. I will say, I, I do think he did Logan Marshall Green an excellent job. Um, if you look at even just his body mannerisms in regard to his acting, mm-hmm. you know, it's very natural at the beginning of the movie. Here where STEM has taken over, is so to speak very robotic stiff movements his posture is like very formulaic yeah it it really does feel like it's not him right like it's a different person walking for him i i don't know if you no. analyze there's a lot of these moments where he changes up his like even again even just his posture to make it look like he's acting like something else is controlling him. A phenomenal job. Yeah. Well, he, uh, this was a, a conscious effort. He um, based his movement while under stems control on a character from Overwatch. Well, I, I mean, I assume it wasn't accidental. 
<laughs> no, but like the fact that he actually he based it off of like an existing set of movement, I thought was really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he goes through his copy of all the police reports, uh, watching drone footage, yada yada. Uh, and then we finally hear Stem, uh, a very I would say calming robotic voice. Um, and at this point, I have written, and now the movie has gone full tech venom. I'm a little disappointed. Uh, Stem is voiced perfectly fine, um, I guess by Simon Maiden. Yeah. But I was really hoping they would have pulled a Venom and just had Logan Marshall Green do like the voice acting in, in another voice. Uh, it would have been Hardy cool. I, I have no problem with Simon doing the voice of Stem, though. Um, I think it it works perfectly. It's very cool, calm, collected, sterile, if you will. Like it is very much a, a, like the voice I expect a computer would have if it had one. Well, I mean, it's a computer. It's going to have whatever's programmed in there. It's not like it's relying on a voice box. But if it's not Lo Logan Marshall Green, get like some fancy British voice. <laughs> Just go on. Get some British voice. Uh, elegant, you know. Refined. Oh yeah, yeah. You, I guess you don't want some like drunken Cockney Not accent. Like <laughs> Hello, Gray. <laughs> like, oh god, Aaron, <laughs> Aaron, where's the mute button? Um, Stem points out that in the the drone footage, uh, the man who shot Asha wasn't actually holding a gun. And it must have been implanted in his hand, which I thought was a pretty cool idea. Um, I don't know if it really fits in this movie because I feel like that's a little too technologically advanced for this world, but eh, it adds to the story. Uh, and then Stem notices a military tattoo on the wrist of one of the criminals and makes Gray draw it. Um, and the tattoo contains all of the man's identification because I guess that's what military tattoos in 2046 do. Um, what, what, did you, what did you think about how he made Gray draw it on the paper? Well, that was like a, one of those old printers, right? Yeah. Um, I guess it would have to be government mandated, I would imagine, because why would you get a tattoo of all of your identification willingly? Yeah, and these guys would have to be like black ops, right? So yeah, if you like, got left behind, to be like, all right, let's just find out every little bit of information about this person <laughs> so we can track all of the... All of the movie seems like a poor decision. It's if you're gonna decision. be like covert or something like that, yeah. But uh, I mean, it it does. It's nice, right? Gray was completely useless. The police were completely useless, and now you have Stem here, essentially sketching out like pretty much everything they need to know, but written in a way where it makes sense. Even though I question a military tattoo. <laughs> Yeah. If that exists in the world, yeah, like a machine might be the only thing that could catch something like that minute detail in a video. From like that standpoint, just accepting the idea that a military tattoo exists is very well written. Yeah, it's so cool too because the the focus it's very out of focus. Like you cannot see this tattoo with the human eye, but because of STEM. He can capture everything, but this puts us in a weird situation because now Gray has all of the information to like start the investigation proper. But he but, has to hide that he's crippled. But or he has to hide STEM. Yeah. So he has no means of explaining how he got all his information. So they really have no proof. So what do you do in that situation? Oh, you take care of, you take it into your own hands. Then go to the man's house in his wheelchair and breaks in. It, I know it's it's not funny at all. See, but this is where I'm getting back to, like, the guy's house is in, like, I forget what it's called. The old town that he's from. Yeah, the old right? neighborhood. And, like, Gray's familiarity with it doesn't come into play at all. And to the point, like, he's just driving down the street right on camera. Not even like, oh... I know where there's back alleys I can use that would get like, there's no yeah, he's purpose just for his it to be his old neighborhood down the middle of the road. Yeah. I do love the smug look on his face a lot of the time when he knows that he can move, but he's pretending that he can't. Well, yeah, because I mean, Hey, he was essentially completely useless 
Yeah. And now STEM has made gray matter. <laughs> oh, please tell me that was a pun. No. Gray matter, brain. Yeah, he has a purpose. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. I, I guess know. you're, you're I, still recovering. I know. You hate me. It's fine. <laughs> um, Gray goes through the messages on uh, this man's smart table. I should say the character's name is Cirque. We don't really find that out until a bit later on, but this is Cirque's house. Um, uh, rummages through the rest of the house. Uh, Cirque returns and they fight. Gray's losing, so he allows Stem to take over his body's functions and we see Stem's fighting capabilities, um, which, uh, I mean, Cirque doesn't last that long. No, he does not. Uh, again, more amazing camera work that we talked about before. Um, perfect movement where like, he's laying on the ground, allows Stem to take over, and just shoots upward. Perfect shot. Like this, The acting in this movie is solid all around. Just watching his face react to stem's movements um what did you think about that kill though that was probably one of the most graphic things i've seen in a movie in a very long time i think the best thing about that kill is how great does he want to see it <laughs> no he wants no part of it like i can't stress how good of a job he does or it's like you know as an actor he's physically doing the actions but then you just see on his face, he's looking away, he's squinting, and he does an amazing job making it look like he is revolted by the things that he is doing, which really conveys yep. the idea that he doesn't control. No, this at least in that scenario, right? This entire scene looks like it's a dual performance by one character. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Uh, we get the coroner scene uh, with Cortez next. Um, corner explaining the body modifications uh, that Cirque had, which yeah, it seemed really rudimentary and gross, and I kind of liked it because it, it kind of seems like you know, the, like uh, all of the the cyberpunk uh, twenty seventy seven shit, or like all of the intense body modifications. This seemed to me to be like the birth of that, where you actually have the wires running through the, the muscles under the skin and like, they're just kind of sticking out and can get hooked on things. And it just made me queasy. I don't get, it's much like gray being from the old town. Like at what point do the body modifications assist Cirque in any way? Does he even use them in the fight? Not really. I don't think so. It's just there to be a clue, I guess at this point. That's a very good point. I never really thought about that. Uh, yeah, there's no reason for him. I guess unless he was just he's just part of that group of soldiers, I guess, or ex-military yeah, or whatever. But even are. later when you see like Fisk, right, who yeah. does use some of his modifications to kill people, mm -hmm. they could have just been done with a gun. Like yeah, the body modifications are just there to be there. Yeah. Cuz Cirque also has a uh, a gun built into his arm where he just loads bullets through like his upper forearm just underneath his elbow and then the barrel would come out of the palm of his hand yeah like just have him carry a gun yeah I mean the world is advanced undeniably uh, it doesn't need to be that advanced to tell this story actually I think that would make stem seem that much more fantastic yeah well um, but yeah during the whole process they also discovered some quote good old fashioned engine grease which, I mean, doesn't really could make only, sense to me. Could only lead to one person. But he hasn't been working on the car. Not for months. <laughs> so, I mean, I get it. They're like, oh, this means it's gray. Or, like, clues Cortez in that it could be gray. But if he hasn't been working on that car in, yeah, like, six months. Why it, is it's like there? when stem took over he just went like jogging in the garage for a while yeah <laughs> it's boot uh aaron informs gray that he's tracking him and uh warns war uh, warns him of the repercussions if anyone was to find out about stem and cortez uses the drone footage to see somebody resembling gray in a wheelchair at cirque's home uh which you brought up like why why put yourself out in the open like that Especially when you know there are police drones flying around. Uh, so she decides to pay him a visit. 
Like, honestly, you are from the area. You tell me he couldn't have gone into like a building in his wheelchair, said that he was there to visit or something, and then on foot gone through like a sewer or just something, just something to indicate he has a familiarity with it to give us a reason to say he's from that area. Honestly, get your wheelchair under a tree or like under some awning or something. Get up, keep your head down and run. Don't look up. And yeah. Oh, Uh, he did have a really good quote uh, in that scene. I don't know if you remember it, where he's just like, you're not accusing me of doing anything. Are you detective? Because I've got a pretty strong alibi here as he's just stuck in his wheelchair. Um, Stem tells Gray to check out the bar Old Bones, but warns him that Aaron is watching and they try to remotely shut him down. Um, do you remember the bar scene? Do you have a take on the bar scene at all? Um, like, before they go to the bathroom, do you mean? Uh, including the fight, too. But yeah, I just mean, like, it's a really, like, weird... I, I think the bar looks really cool, filled with degenerates and whatnot. Like, it seems almost like a, a punk biker bar. Um... But yeah, it just Gray seems even being from this neighborhood, he seems too clean cut to actually be believable in this environment, and I feel like they play with that really well. Now, I like when he calls everybody out, still in his wheelchair, to try and <laughs> um, bait out the guy that he's looking for. Yeah, because he knows that there's going to be like a cockiness there. Like it's like essentially, it's like yeah, it's me. What are you gonna do in your wheelchair? Yeah. That would be Tolan, that character's name. Yeah, fodder. I don't remember their names. Yeah, yeah, no, and nor should you. But they, I love they didn't how- need names, really. Like a, a lot of these, Cirque and Tolan, they they didn't need names. Yeah. Um, I do want to jump back one second for when Gray goes into the bar and asks for uh, whiskey and a straw, because he's still. <laughs> In his wheelchair, and then gets the guy, like the drunk guy at the bar next to him, to like hold the glass in front of his mouth, and he's just sipping at it with this shit eating grin on his face. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in that scene, unless he's worried about the police, he could have at least just pretended that his hands moved. Yeah, I'm in a wheelchair from, yep, like the, you know, the torso down or something. Yep, I, I thought about that too. Like, nobody but, there mean, knows him. I guess he's got to cover up in case the cops come to these lowlifes who are going to be so eager to snitch. Yeah. Well, Tolan takes him into the uh, the bathroom. And the bartender, Manny, just turns up the music so nobody hears the commotion. Like the, Obviously a rough bar. Um, <clears throat> Stem turns off Gray's pain receptors uh, for the scene where Tolan drives the knife into his leg. Beautifully done. Yeah, I thought that was fantastic. And Tolan is just surprised. Like, he really thought, you probably are faking it, and you're going to feel this knife. Yep. And he keeps testing different points on Gray's body to see where, like, where he starts to feel. And they're just questioning each other. Gray just wants to get confirmation that Tolan was at the murder scene. And when he admits to it, he allows Stem to take over. And Stem just kicks ass and kills everyone. Yeah. Didn't know he was a ninja. (laughs) But before dying, uh, Tolan tells Gray that he was paid by Fisk to do the hit. Which I find weird, because I'm pretty sure Fisk was the one that killed Asha. So maybe a company along for the hit? Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, The one thing I thought that was kind of cool, but we never really get too much into which i think would be a really good spinoff for the uh, like another film is that gray discovers that tolan's implants were produced by the company that asha worked for Mm -hmm. and that's never really addressed after that no it was a competing company with aaron's yeah stuff but aaron tries to shut stem down and stem tells gray to get certain hacker get to a certain hacker who will be able to stop it i don't like any of this scene no no, you get a wheelchair scene where he's like leaving the bar uh, and he just says to this other guy in a wheelchair, keep an eye on it, will you, buddy? And then gets up and runs away after locking it. And the guy in the wheelchair is like, faker, 
and then, and then gets up onto his up. chair. Yeah, yeah. It sits in uh, Grace. Yeah. I like that. I th- it was it was good. That's fine. That's fine. But like as Gray is slow or stem slowly being shut down, like he stem gets him to write all the info the hacker needs on his own arm. And by the time he gets to the hacker, stem's pretty much been shut down to the point where Gray's dragging himself along the floor. I did like that he was hopping down the hallway before collapsing. Again, amazing physical acting. But so, then we, so is is Aaron like legit trying to shut down Stem here, or is this part of the facade? Well, that's just it. Because at this point, we're led to believe that he's like Stem is very valuable. We can't let the world know that this exists right now, and all that Gray is doing is drawing attention to himself leaving behind a trail of bodies. Like it makes sense for the story right now. Um, but uh, as we find out later on, no, this, this isn't Aaron. Do you remember that part? I'm just, yeah. <laughs> uh, the hacker, Jamie, I really don't like. What was I don't the like... point of this? Um, well, the, exactly what i was just saying uh, it seems inconsequential but actually is huge to the plot i just don't like the hacker themselves um it's a weird scene where people are in like vr headsets and having been doing so for days possibly weeks on end mm-hmm. i'm curious to know what kind of vr that is but jamie takes gray in reboots stem and leaves him helpless on the floor when fisk shows up because she can't afford to be caught um, and then we, after this, well, actually not after this, during this whole scene was when uh, Fisk went to the bar, Old Bones, to confront Manny, the bartender, and sneezes nanobots. This was the stupidest part of the entire movie. It was really dumb. Really, this, really dumb. It did not need is, to happen. for some reason, an ability you have that you choose not to use more often, which again, could have just been the gun in your hand. Yep. It's just so stupid. It was but, so, so, so stupid. And they just enter his respiratory system and they're they're carrying blades and just shred him from the inside. So dumb. I'd say probably the weakest part of the movie. Easily. Without question. Uh, Fisk and another soldier, they're trying to kill Grey. Um, I don't know. What do, you, what, what do you think about the gun arm? I think it's stupid. Yeah, I mean... I feel like the majority of upgrades that, you know, beings in cyberpunk settings have would serve very clear-cut beneficial beneficial reasons. Yeah. Having it in your arm as just being a gun is not like, oh, you can conceal a weapon for a bit? Cool. You still can't even get through a metal detector. And what happens if it jams? Like... What if it misfires? <laughs> it blows his hand off. <laughs> it's just so dumb. Yeah. I mean, again, cool idea. Looks dumb and doesn't add anything to the story. I think it's just the cheapest way they could have done special effects wise to make it look like it. Because they could just put little oh. knobs on the hand. Be like, oh yeah, there's a gun inside, and we've saved a whole bunch of money in our special effects budget. I didn't have a big budget, so that does make sense, and that's really that is very smart. It's just unnecessary. Yeah, because um, I mean, again, you could have just had him carrying a gun, and just said that he essentially had heightened senses from his upgrades or something, and what it would like, whatever, whatever. It's yeah. a, it's it's completely stupid, but it's not a big enough deal to get caught up on. <laughs> good thing we didn't get caught up on it right now then but mm-hmm. stem has hey, full control i didn't want to talk about it you strong-armed me into it shut up <laughs> that wasn't even a good pun yeah, all right fine yeah, i know because it wasn't a gun arm i get it whatever. yeah exactly cool staircase escape scene though right after yeah, stem whatever. fully reboots jerk uh <laughs> stem... okay though okay we do get a scene where the gun arm is kind of fun and that's where stem kills a soldier by breaking his arm and using his own gun arm to blow his head off again could have just been a gun in his hand i know but it looks cool for a fucking movie yes sure 
the exact same motions could have happened with him breaking an arm that was holding it a gun. Justify, it just no, no, it wouldn't. Yeah, it would have looked no, visually the same on No, camera. it wouldn't have. It would have yeah, looked so would. much worse. The exact same. No. You don't even know what you're talking about. I know exactly how, what I'm talking how would, about. How would, it, how would that even look the same? It justifies, and now after we've complained about this fucking gun arm for so long, <laughs> it actually justifies it in the movie. And you're trying to remove that? It, that doesn't make any sense. The only argument you could fantastic. have is that he did. If he broke an arm like that, that it would drop a gun that it was holding. Yes. Eh, it's not enough. Gray doesn't have a gun. No. It what do you mean? It's not enough. It's not enough of a reason to justify having a gun arm for one kill. Ah, yes, it looked amazing. It totally uh, justifies it. I go back on everything I said about the gun arm. I think you're the problem in this conversation. I think the only real benefit was from a special effects budget because it was a lot easier to make it a modification that could be justified on camera with very little actual physical, like visual work. I guess, yeah, it, it doesn't really need to be there. But the, like, it, I don't know. That did, okay, never mind. I'm not going to get into it. Stem, calm, bend down. <sighs> Gray returns home only to find his mom is there and has just seen him walking out of his wheelchair. Uh, immediately, he has to confess everything to her. Uh, why? I don't know. I, I wouldn't tell her that I've been killing people. I'd just be like, yeah. I mean, he does walk in with blood all over him. Uh, you can come up with an excuse for that pretty easily. I'm sure Stem could have and fed it to him, but I don't know. Then we get emo Aaron sitting in his mansion crying over losing con connection to STEM. <clears throat> I don't, was I don't... he crying because he lost connection? No, like, I'm really rethinking this now. Oh, no, that's what we're led to believe. That is not why. Yeah. Cortez visits Gray again, questions him about the bar fight, because obviously she's going to find out that he was there. Uh, he tries to reason with STEM, telling it they have to stop what they're doing. I don't know why. But then Stem immediately shuts down and passive aggressively reminds Gray that with without him, Gray is just a paraplegic. And this is where we find out what the hacker was actually doing. Um, when she was hacking into Stem, she removed the ability for Gray to control Stem's actions. And Stem states that they're going to finish the job they started. He can take over control of Gray's body whenever he wants to. And I thought that was a great twist. Absolutely brilliant. I'm judging or judging. I'm assuming by your silence, you disagree. I'm still very much torn on this whole thing. Why? I mean, it gets very problematic when we get a full explanation, but yeah, up yeah, until we'll this point, we'll okay. get to it. Um, Stem goes through Cobalt's database, uh, the company that Asha worked for, and finds info on the people they perform cybernetic surgeries on. Uh, they get in this car and head out. But Gray finds a bug that Cortez planted on him, and we get a car chase, which is kind of a throwaway car chase. It's there to have a car chase. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, it's passable. It's fine. Nothing out of the world. Uh, Stem hacks a nearby smart car and uses it to crash into Cortez, which I thought was really cool. Uh, a neat idea, uh, which allows him to escape. Uh, Cortez goes back to the house where Gray's mother tells her everything. Yeah, she recovered from that collision pretty quickly. I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> like, this is a high speed chase, and she got completely, completely demolished by this smart car. And yo, what's up? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I, right? I was in an accident. You see, I got a little blood on my forehead. It's uh, clearly I'm I'm okay. Oh, man, I think I've been watching too much OSW because my next note says Gray Pearl Harbor's Fisk. And the former soldier breaks down what's happening. But Fisk reveals he wasn't hired to kill Asha. He was ordered to paralyze Gray. Uh, they fight and Fisk has the upper hand until Gray mocks him with the death of Cirque, who was Fisk's brother, uh, allowing Gray the chance to kill him. And which honestly was a pretty cool fight scene. I'd say the best fight scene of the movie. Yeah, I just found it a little too predictable that it was yes. so many statements of don't like don't let emotion control you, don't let emotion control you, and then Fisk lets emotion control him. Yeah. Uh, I mean the fight scene was well done, the camera work was good. 
uh, I, like honestly, some of the actual action was done in a fantastic way to make it look like these weren't just two regular people. Mm-hmm. But just that getting the upper hand by taunting him with his brother was just like, and you're not even trying here, man. Yeah, that is a good point. The the weird thing for me though is that Stem thanks Gray for killing Fisk. I don't fully understand that one. I think it was because I think the whole thing that they were trying to convey there was that Stem could not calculate oh, a way right. to beat Fisk because Stem and had no taunting. yeah had no actual like connection with human emotions and just from like a on paper logic ones and zeros couldn't think of a way to beat him. Yeah. And it was, it was gray using like the human convention of emotion to give them the upper hand to win that. And yeah, that makes again, perfect sense. And Stem I feel, needs um, gray alive just as much to survive as the other way around, even though I don't necessarily agree with that, but it's okay. Yeah. Uh, they scan Fisk's phone to find out who paid him for the attack. Uh, Gray hears a message from Aaron telling Fisk that he needs to finish this because he's going to find and kill both of them. Ominous. Gray goes to Aaron's house for the final confrontation, takes out the guards without even looking at them, which I thought was hilarious. Yeah, just comes down the stairs. Bam, looking bam. At the ground. Uh, so good. So good. I uh, confronts Aaron, but Cortez is already there waiting for him. Stem attacks her, even though now, Gray... How the hell did Cortez get there? I don't know, man. She's superhuman. It has to be, because she was walking just fine and got back to Gray's place just fine after that car accident. Then fucking teleports over to Aaron's place somehow. How she even knew to go to Aaron's place? Even if he told his mom everything and the mom told um, Cortez, Cortez, did... When when Gray was spilling uh, the beans, give exact directions on how to get there and who, it, like... Well, no, I'm pretty sure a lot of people would know where Aaron lives. But if Gray's mother told Cortez that he's up and walking again and he's seeking revenge and this is why he's up and walking, she's like, well, I don't understand how the fuck that works. Let's go talk to Aaron. And she just happened to be there when Gray showed up. That's my guess. That's the closest... That would make sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, stem attacks her, even though Gray pleads for him not to. Um, and one part that I thought was really cool is that Gray, as he's assaulting Cortez, convinces her to tase him, which would temporarily stop stem. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was kind of a neat idea. Just shock him for a second. Um, <clears throat> Aaron reveals that stem actually runs his company and orchestrated everything. And it was planned by Stem the whole, like the entire time, the entire event of the film, um, because Stem needed a pure human body, untainted by technology, so it could evolve within it. Is a weird explanation for the reasoning of this plot. Mm-hmm. But Stem, in control of Gray, kills Aaron and Cortez, and Gray wakes up in the hospital. But Asha is there, and to him, it was all just a dream. Where in reality, Stem causes Gray to have a complete mental breakdown, which allows it to take over his body. Uh, the new perfect evolution of man merged with machine. Gray is forever trapped in his own mind in a fake world where everything is fine and Stem is let loose upon the world. Fade to black and roll credits. It's a bleak end. I dug the ending. I didn't like the reasoning for the ending, though. I'm with you on that 100%. So, yeah, man. So, like... When Aaron was trying to shut down Stem, it wasn't, I guess, to stop Gray. I think it was Aaron's attempt to stop, to stop Stem. Him. Exactly. Because he knew that Stem was getting too you know, powerful, was going to come for him, whatever. And that Even was the that, line about uh, kill us both to Fisk. Yeah, he's talking about Stem, not Gray. I find it hard to believe. <laughs> Even in this scenario, I can't imagine that this is the case yeah but it's fine i i I do like the fact though that it was worked into stem's plan to get to the hacker to remove whatever needed to be removed so that he could actually take control of gray's body without the actual command 
Mm -hmm. But you don't really get that until later on. And I think that's why I hated that scene the first time I saw it. But upon rewatch, I was like, I completely forgot this scene even really happened. But it makes perfect sense now. What, like, without giving like like, Aaron would have had other opportunities to hack STEM before the moment when they were actually going to get the hacker. Fucking break it. You showed it to Gray and Asha. Just break it. Yeah, if at that point it's already controlling the company, it's already externally sending commands, and yes, maybe it doesn't have a physical manifestation, but it's able to, you know, use a phone to hire a yeah. hit or something. Unless Aaron is completely fine with that, he, he clearly must know that tr- uh, uh, STEM has like essentially put this hit out on Gray and is fine with the machine ordering a murder then are you a villain or not? Because at that point, you easily could have just broken the damn thing. I would say a puppet, for sure. But it tries to have like this weird redemption arc that doesn't work? I I don't know. Aaron, I I just, I I don't like Aaron. That's a poorly written character, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to say right now, this was written and directed by Lee Whannell who is fantastic, wrote the the new Invisible Man movie, uh, some of the Saw movies and Insidious movies, uh, worked a lot with James Wan, um, Australian filmmakers, film done, like made in Australia, super low budget for what would be a theatrical really, a theatrically released movie. Um, do you want to guess what the budget was, though? Because we talked about it here and there, especially with the gun arm that you hate. Um... I don't hate the gun arm. I hate its implementation and purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, this can't be that high. I'm going to say seven million. Three million. Oh, shit. This movie looks absolutely amazing for having a $3 million budget. Even if you just look at like camera and color work and stuff like that, mm-hmm. this is impressive for that low of a budget. Yeah, it's amazing. Like They used that money well. But did it make that money back? What do you think? I'm going to say no. Um, I'm going to say that what was probably lower than their budget might have been their marketing budget because I had no idea this even existed. Mm -hmm. Uh, No. No, I'm going to say it maybe brought in a million. Well, you're right if you add another 16 million to that. Holy shit. Yeah, made seventeen million off a three million dollar budget. It's good. That's very good. I'd I mean, say so. And that means that people went to see it in the small amount of theaters it was released in. Like this is I don't know why it didn't get a wider release. Mm. Um going into like ratings, like what what do you I'm assuming you already saw the IMDB. No, rating. sir. Or, no. Yeah, do you wanna care to take a guess at what uh the trolls on IMDB thought about it? Trolls makes me think that it got lower than it should have. I shouldn't have said trolls, but most people on there are. Thank uh, God they got rid of those message boards. 6.4? 7.5. Oh, good. Res- respectable. Yeah. Um, But the lowest of all of the ratings when you compare them to uh, Rotten Tomatoes, Tomato Meter and Audience Score one point away from each other. When uh, does that happen? Very rarely, man. Like, this is, I would say, majority majority of people who view this movie love it. Overwhelming majority, actually. 88% from critics and 87 from audience. I mean, that's I high. Honestly cannot think of a time where a tomato, the tomato meter has been that close. No, me neither. But yeah, I don't know. Like, um, I don't know. There's just so much about this movie that's intriguing interesting uh worthy of discussion i i I can understand why the ratings are so high um did you want to talk a little bit more about the movie you want to go right into awards i don't really have much more to say about the movie okay let's do awards then all righty so you lead us off with worst performance or no 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 sorry sorry it's not worst performance anymore it's um uh, least least favorite favorite character. character for whatever reason and that obviously would be Aaron Keen. 
played by Harrison Gilbertson or Gilbert Stun. Sorry. Um, it just didn't need to be there. Uh, well, I mean, and somebody it, honestly, had to, somebody had to create the, the stem for sure. Yeah. But the character is on screen way too much without anything to do. Uh, definitely doesn't need to be as emo as he is throughout the whole thing. And like the, the whole like storm cloud, like the augmented reality storm cloud thing that it, he's introduced with just seemed weird. And he just seems so detached from what's happening, but is so involved with the plot. Like it just doesn't really work for me. Like, obviously it's an, it's an Elon Musk style character, but it just kind of falls short for me. And I don't think that's, <clears throat> I don't think that's Harrison's fault. I just think it's a, it's a shitty character. Well, I, I definitely think that if you look at the characters um, overall, yeah, his writing was the weakest in regards to consistency. Mm-hmm. So, again, not his fault. I actually yeah. think that Harrison Gilbertson did a phenomenal job like acting as this socially awkward tech genius type character. Uh, even as much as like when he goes to the hospital and he's wearing like the gloves and he doesn't and even, the mask and yeah yeah and he doesn't even want to shake hands earlier like I think he does a very good job of it I just think that the writing had a little too many gaps in that character um, that any actor really could have saved it yeah and had I had I seen this pre pandemic I'd be like okay this guy's definitely like Howard Hughes level like germaphobe but now I'm like this is just normal. <laughs> Mm, fair uh favorite character or wait that was was he your least favorite no no oh, okay no go for no, it no, no. Uh, i was a uh, benedict hardy as fisk really Hmm. interesting mm -hmm. why uh again it's not the actor necessarily although he should get points deducted for that horrible mustache um that i just really terrible terrible mustache i just think that like and again like we were saying with Aaron, victim of the writing. Like, he's the one who's almost, like, mentoring Gray in the ways of being a man, like, a manipulated, altered cyber, like, being. Mm -hmm. Telling him to not let his emotions get the best of him. And then his emotions get the best of him. And he has this ability to shoot snot, like, blades. I don't under the Good old snot blades. Sign me like, up for that. Honestly, what was the purpose <laughs> of this character that couldn't have been achieved by just having him be like henchman X that was just the bigger, stronger one than the rest of them? And like they make him out to be like the leader just under, you know, the next rung under where all the other henchmen are at the very bottom. Yeah. But he does nothing really leadership like. Like it just. This is just a terrible character. Again, no, like no slam on Benedict Hardy's performance. Although shave that mustache, you should definitely shave that mustache. But the character of Fisk is just awful. You, I mean, yeah. Cirk and Tolan were better villains than Fisk in this. I before it'd the be fight like scene, if, like it'd be like if the lowest rung goon in a gang just dummied his way to being the last survivor. It's like, it's no, not I burned. I, I disagree with that. Mm. But up until the fight with gray, I was okay with Fisk. And honestly, this is the only time I can think of recently anyway, where as I was watching the movie, I was already hoping there was going to be a sequel to flesh out these characters more. I was so excited for that because I wanted to know more. I just didn't have the, they didn't have the time to explain anymore. Imagine this, a sequel this... where they flip it and a whole bunch of these villains become the protagonists trying to stop gray. Who's now just become super stem. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. But like, I mean, they killed them all off. So, <laughs> and I know. And like, as I, as they started dropping, I was like, Oh no. Like, even if they did one of these, like, hinted that Fisk maybe survived and they just, they were too concerned with moving on that they didn't. And then they switched it and Fisk was the hero and he was trying to find a way to stop STEM. That'd be a great sequel and not one that you would expect. Well, they were going to do a sequel. Ah, they should still. Yeah, but 
then the sequel film idea was trashed and they decided to do uh they're going to do a tv series where mm -hmm. and i hate the fact that well obviously like you're not going to get logan marshall green back but they were going to have um an evolved version of stem and a new host that the government would use as a way to uh fight crime like this is that sounds bad. terrible it sounds absolutely terrible it sounds like, like shitty robocop at this point it's i robocop feel like three quality at this point you essentially make stem skynet and have it where you need to have an uprising against stem that's amazing not, that's a fantastic not. idea sign me up for that get that movie made now <laughs> what can you rely on sandro for every episode a terrible pun and giving ben an idea for a better movie uh <laughs> oh, you're not wrong man like <laughs> you have shitty jokes and good ideas i don't understand how that works oh better than good jokes and shitty ideas i guess i don't know um i lead us off with favorite character and I'm i gonna think be... i think you can speak for the both of us on this one I was going to say myself, I, I think I'm going to be bold enough to assume that you have the same one here. Hands down, didn't even have to think about it. Not a second, you know, even glance at it. Logan Marshall Green as Great Trace. Fuck yeah, man. Is there anything that this guy did not... And I mean, even if this was the old Best Actor Award, like... Is there anything that this actor character combination didn't do? Phenomenal performance, great character that you immediately feel for in the movie up give, until the end. Like, it's just give I, this man a fucking trophy. I don't care what it is. Just be like, here, thank you so much for this movie. <laughs> like, it's a bowling trophy, whatever. It's just thank you. It's a token. Yeah. He did yeah. so well in this movie. I probably one of my best performances I've seen in the last 10 years. Oh, phenomenal. And again, the character is well written so well for a sympathetic lead. Yep. Just you go through a series of emotions on this character's journey. Uh, it's just, I, I don't think there is a way to improve this. And this is why I wanted you to watch this movie. Cause I have, I, I can't remember a character that stands out so well. That's played so well and just works with the story. Like everything about Gray Trace and Logan Marshall Green fits perfectly in Upgrade. Yeah. It's the perfect combination of Venom meets Terminator. This is a, we'll just call this movie Better Venom. <laughs> this is what Venom wanted to be and failed at miserably twice. Mm hmm. That being said, I do love Tom Hardy. He's one of my favorites. It's just unfortunate. Moving on to memorable line. That's you, buddy. I went with a humorous one, and you already referenced it. It was during the uh, the bathroom fight. Okay. Where uh, Gray finally fights back after Tolan stabs him in the leg and whatnot. He's like, did you see that? Because hmm? you thought I was an invalid, but you didn't know that I'm a fucking ninja. And Stem just clues in with, while I'm state-of-the-art Gray... I am not a ninja. Every time I see that, I still chuckle. It's not that good, but it always stands out to me. Do you is your line memorable or favorite? I guess those are almost synonymous. My uh my line is probably number like 178 out of a potential 178 that you would expect it to be. Okay. <laughs> My most memorable line was when he said to his wife, Asha, can't lives on won't street, lady. It's pretty fucking good. And one of the reasons is, like two days after watching this movie, I actually said that no. line in my real life. Oh my god, I was going to ask that. <laughs> oh, you fucking mark. I caught myself saying that, and I was just like, how? How is that? What stuff? <laughs> oh my god! I suggested a movie that left a real imprint on you. <laughs> wow, you're welcome. It's not what you would have expected at all. No. Oh, that's <laughs> there. It is. That's legit happened. So, what am I supposed to say? That's fucking hilarious. Well done. Uh, on to uh, 
memorable scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, turn. right. That's me. Yeah. Um, so this one is also one that maybe you wouldn't have expected. But it is easily when he is having his mom trim his beard yep. and just starts crying. Yep. I have the exact same thing written down. Really? The yep. amount of emotion, how powerful that scene is. This guy has just had everything stripped from him that he loves, minus his mom. And he's sitting there. And, like, I get it. You know, shit gets difficult. And sometimes you don't have time to sit and reflect with it. Like, when you're getting a sponge bath and you start throwing up, shit's bad. But you're not sitting there reflecting. Yeah. But here's this quiet moment where his mom's doing a good deed for him, getting his beard trimmed. And he's... Obviously, when you're just sitting there getting like a haircut or a beard trim, you're left alone with your thoughts. And just and and again, full compliments to Logan Marshall Green's acting, too. And he just starts breaking down. I was like, and then we're, we're early in the movie, too. So you don't even like if you're watching this for the first time, you really don't know how you're going to feel for the rest of the movie. I honestly yeah. expected it to just be essentially an action movie after that. No emotion, not much thinking, just, you know, shit hits the fan, people, you know, fighting, shooting, whatever, right? Yeah. But, like... This movie has a lot of heart, though, man. It has a lot of heart, but, like, it's almost like that moment is, like, the exact crescendo of the emotional hook for this movie. Oh, and yeah. just from that moment on... I don't know anyone who can not be rooting for this character. Oh, this is a, a hole in one. It, it's, yeah. He, he nailed it. It's perfect. Like you see the sponge bath scene and his mom pulls him up a bit and he starts throwing up and you see him break down as she's cutting his beard. And like, I like both times this happens. I'm thinking, I, I, I really wish I could hug this man. You Cause just, he's so handsome. Uh, it's you know, you know, got a few reasons, <laughs> but no, it's it's. Oh, it, it's safe to say, man, I fucking love this movie. Now, I don't need to ask, but you might as well get into your final thoughts slash recommendations. Buy buy it, buy it now if you can find it. Just own it. I I love this movie. I will recommend this movie to everybody. Uh, it's yeah, I got that tech vibe to it, but. I don't think you're going to see any better acting in a movie anytime soon. Um, it just sucks that he's not getting more recognition for his role as uh, as Gray Trace. Logan Marshall Green's fantastic. The writing, while it does have some problems, it's still done uh, by Lee Whannell and directed by Lee Whannell, and I think he's incredibly competent. I just think that if they had a bigger budget, they really could have done a lot more with it. And I would have liked to have seen maybe even a longer version of this movie, like a director's cut, maybe. I would definitely love to see the same crew and like cast and and talent come back for a sequel. Keep that TV idea the fuck away from me. But I just, this is a massive world that I want to explore. Uh, I want to see more of these characters, like... What they gave me was great for a movie, and I love it, but I just, I want more. And that's just me being, you know, greedy, because what they gave us was a fantastic character with a pretty good story. No real complaints there, just nitpicks. But if you get a chance to see it, definitely, you can watch it with friends, you can watch it by yourself. I don't care, but fucking watch the movie. It's so good. Sorry about that little rant. What do you think? I think it's a great movie. I think anybody who is a fan of action movies should watch it. Um, there's obviously a, a group of people who are not going to enjoy it, but they're not going to enjoy any movie in this genre. Yeah. The amount of emotion and just stellar action or acting, sorry, that you get in an action movie is not often seen, right? Yep. An action movie is usually like, I just need a reason for the revenge plot. I just need a reason for Fist to start flying. This one gives you that, but with an actual good story and fantastic performances. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't know what form a sequel could take, as we could probably brainstorm a number of them. I mean, hell, you could have a, a sequel that's entirely Logan Marshall Green inside of his mind world trying to fight his way back out 
Mm -hmm. get control of his body over stem. And honestly, I think Logan Marshall Green has the acting chops after just seeing him in this one movie to pull that off. Oh, yeah. Um, But we're never going to see another sequel if people don't put some money into this. And I think they should. Don't just watch it. Don't just stream it. Find a way to drop a few bucks on it. This movie absolutely deserves it. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. I love it. I love it so much. All right. Well, I'm not used to this. I do have to say one thing first. (laughs) Any any fans of the OC, I don't know if you ever watched that show. Mm -mm. Um, He was in nine episodes of the OC as uh, Trey Atwood, Ryan's uh, brother. And I actually forgot about that until right now. So kind of makes me want to watch the OC again. Anyway, you were saying. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, Sorry, man. I didn't mean to fuck you up there. Well, I mean, if you guys have any uh, thoughts on Upgrade because you've listened to this episode or taken our advice and checked it out, you know, hit us up. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it. You can hit us up on social media. We are on Twitter at BS Bargain Bin, Facebook.com slash BS Bargain Bin. And of course, there is a lovely handy um, chat section underneath every one of our YouTube videos. I can't imagine we're going to both enjoy a movie as much as we did this one next week, but <laughs> here's hoping. Um, I, I don't like on how you started Andy. laughing immediately uh, when I said that. No, I've been laughing the whole time after you said lovely handy, but continue. <laughs> I said lovely handy? Yeah, chat section. Anyway, you want to know what we're talking <laughs> about next week? <laughs> I did. I did. Uh, yeah, well done. Well, uh, I mean, it's not that kind of a chat section, okay? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, next week we're. Uh, at, mm, mm, I'm still torn. <laughs> Don't like how you're doing this, man. All right, I, no, I'm changing my mind. Last second, we haven't talked about this actor yet on 71 episodes. Well, maybe a mention, but never covered one of their films. So I figure we may as well. Is go it big Nicholas Cage? Home. It is Nick Cage. Oh. <laughs> and I was originally going to give you three genres to pick from, but you said you didn't want to pick, so I'm going to have to pick for us. So in 2006, they remade one of my all-time favorite movies, and I decided that next week we'll be talking about 2006's The Wicker Man. Afternoon. Sorry. It's okay. I'll get it. Give me your hand! Edward, I know that we haven't spoken in a few years. I need your help. I need your help. I have a daughter. Her name is Rowan. She has been missing for two weeks now. I fear she is in danger, so now I turn to you. Be careful and believe nothing that you see or hear. Lost your bearings? Oh, hey. Sorry. Snuck up on me there. This is private property. Do you know her? Hmm. I don't recognize this child. Welcome. My little girl is still here. been taken by who I don't know. I'll find her. If she existed, we would know of her. Whose desk is this, hmm? Rowan? Hello? You suspect foul play. The wicker man returns. Who's the wicker man? I'm gonna search every inch of this town. She'll burn to death. She burned to death. I need your help. Daddy.
thought I could avoid ever watching this movie. Mm -mm. All right. Until next week, have a good one. All the best, guys.